That's right. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We know that you all have very busy schedules and taking the time out for this. It's really important for your children. It's important for you to know to have the knowledge. We really feel like knowledge is power. There's so much going on and technology is so different um, than when we were growing up. Um, and so it's really changing and it's probably changing by the time this presentation is over. But thank you again for coming. Um, as Joe had mentioned, I am Nicole Yetter. I serve as a guidance counselor at Northland High School. Before that, I served as a guidance counselor at Hatfield Elementary School. Um, and now I've um, been implementing the Olvaez program district-wide. So we actually, at the end of this year, we'll have all 13 elementary schools up and running, all three middle schools, so we're really excited about that. It's going really well. So um, tonight, as he mentioned, we're going to talk about a couple different topics. We're going to talk about internet safety in a general sense. We're going to talk about cyberbullying, what that looks like and sounds like for children. We're going to talk about the use of cell phones and what kids are able to do with their cell phones, and not even with cell phones, but also just with their um, eye, t eye touches or um, those kind of technologies that you may not even think, you know, they're not cell phones. You know, Apple puts out the um, eye touch or those things where the kids play music, but they can all text on them, console, you know, do different things, chats. Um, so we're going to kind of go over all those things with you and, dip, you know, the different sites that are out there that you should really familiarize yourself with and really have a conversation with your children about. Um, we handed out a handout that at some point takes some time to peruse. You can get this brochure and plenty of information. This is through McGruff. You remember him, the crime dog. In there you also see a lot of resources. One of them I'll direct your attention to is NetSmarts. Um, that's a great website. It's actually a district approved website, so we do use it with your children in the schools, and you're going to see some clips from NetSmarts here tonight. Some of the information that we're going to share with you is information for you as parents, but we're also going to share a couple of things with you that we actually show the kids um, so that you're on the same page and, again, can help foster that dialogue. Mr. Wilson, thank you for the Thank you. Again, my name is Ray Wilson. I'm called the Safe Schools Coordinator for the district. I do a lot of things. I can, I'm in charge of all the intruder drills that we do at the elementary schools and all the schools in the district. I'm in charge of the our uh, Raptor system which checks the sexual uh, registry of people when they come into middle schools and high school and in charge of a lot of different programs. I overview all the policies and procedures that have anything to do with emergency programs in, in, the, uh, in the school district. And also I'm a, a district school police officer and I get involved in pretty much most of the uh, criminal investigations with the school district. I work closely with, we have six police departments that cover the North End School District and I work with all the police departments. I was a Hatfield police officer for 31 years, and I rose up the ranks. I was a lieutenant, second in charge of the police department when I left, and I was a SWAT commander. And uh, so I used to teach police officers how to respond to, to schools. Now I'm on the other side of it, and I teach staff and, and kids how to be safe in the schools when we, have, when we do the intruder drills and things like that. And then I'm also head of security. I'm in charge of the uh, 20 uh, uh, security officers that we have here in the district so uh, like Nicole said uh, some of these things you've heard before we've done this we've done a lot of presentations with the parents and I'm sure you've heard a lot of these things you've seen a lot of these things but we're just trying to refresh your uh, your knowledge on some of these things I was based in the district office before now this year's my first year I'm actually based with Nicole in the high school and it's a it's a different ball game there I've been involved in a lot of investigations and I will tell you that probably 90% of the investigations I've been involved in are either texting things, emails, sexting, you know, which we'll go over later, and things like that. So it's, it is a, big, that is a big, big part of my job. I have to tell you just a quick funny story, and probably this will explain the reason why we're here. Just this morning, we had a group of security officers, and we were talking about kids and things like that, and I was talking about, I have four grandkids. I just had my fourth grandkid just uh, two months ago. I finally had a girl. I, I have three, three boys, and I finally had a girl, but the one security guy was saying he has two girls, and he says, man, my girls are something else. He has one that's 14. He said she comes home from school, and all she does is run right to her bedroom, and he goes, hi, and she goes, I don't want to talk to you, and runs and slams the door and probably goes on, you know, goes on the computer. Just the other night, he has a six-year-old daughter, and she said, daddy, I want to get a smartphone. And he looks at her, and he goes, he, I don't even know if he knew what a smartphone was. He said, well, what do, you, what do you want a smartphone for? She goes, I want to talk to my friends. And uh, he said, you know what? No, he said, you should be talking to people like Barney and Elmo and things like that. <laughs> but we found out now that with the technology and everything, it, this is really, it's kind of scary, but kids don't talk to each other too much now in school. They text each other. They can be standing five feet away from each other, and they're texting each other. You guys have heard that before, but seriously, it is true. So. 
we hope tonight we'll give you a couple things to take home and uh, you know um, I have some experience investigating some of the internet crimes and things like that uh, we normally do our program with, a, with also Pat Hanrahan and unfortunately uh, his mother just died in fact I just went to her funeral today so um, it's kind of sad but Pat's, Pat's a good guy I worked with Pat for about 25 years and uh, but uh, um, I think between Nicole and I, we can give you, you know, give you some pointers on what to do and things like that. So we would appreciate if you try to hold your questions till the end, because hopefully, if you had a question, we might answer it, and then we can take some questions at the end. All right. The first uh, clip we're going to show you is growing up online. It's a little inside view of what kids are actually going to tell you of what it really looks like, and it, you know what's really happening online that you may or may not be aware of. They are the first generation to call the age on the internet. You need to have data that allows you to talk to your friends because everybody uses it. Just a decade that can go on an hour like a year. This is called a hard virtual society. Now I'm aligned with your I'm really 100% me. I have a whole different persona online. I was only 14. I looked like I was 18. It's a world largely hidden from parents and teachers. <laughs> online because there's no one watching to see what you're actually doing. In general, it's pretty bad. Like if I were a parent, I saw half the thing I would cry. My son had these online relationships that were completely invisible to me. It is a predator looking for your child. But while we struggle to keep up, and we allow her fears for their safety to run wild. They don't realize that when they're sharing on that keyboard, it's like, let them on in, baby. It's not going to go away. It's not a passing fad. And nobody's really in charge. Oh, yeah. It's Friday night, and six friends are having a party. <laughs> they set up camp in a basement rec room with desktop computers, high-definition monitors, and an excess of caffeine. Oh, God. Go! Within minutes, they're locked in battle. Enemy down! There you go. There you go. Die up, man. Across town in the local community center, another party is getting started. <laughs> On one screen, the latest top-rated YouTube video. <laughs> On another, a new heartthrob. Nearby, in his bedroom, a 13-year-old boy is updating his profile on MySpace. My name is Clay Calamity. So I just put Calamity because I thought it sounded cool. These are links to comment me, message me, or add me as a friend. Downstairs, his 7-year-old brother is getting a primer in socializing on the web on Club Penguin. He invited me. He said, if you want to be our friends, I'm his friend now. This is Morris County, New Jersey, but it could be anywhere in America. Here, like in the rest of the country, some 90% of teenagers are online, a number that's still growing. My mom is not home. It's three in the morning. I can do as loud as I want. So that's what we're doing here. For teenagers, the internet is an outlet for self-expression. Hey, hey, a place to complain about adults. Yeah. And a means to connect with each other. Uh, my name is Lorenzo, and I want to be your friend. This is the first generation to come of age immersed in a virtual world outside the reach of their parents. It's really hard to control what our kids are doing online. What we have here is kind of the new Wild West. Nobody's really in charge. Keep it going. It's just this huge shift in which the internet and the digital world was something that belonged to adults. And now it's something that really is the province of teenagers. So there's a proliferation of pictures and videos and them living their lives, in essence, online. This is a generation that sees online not as a separate place you go, but it's just a sort of continuation of their, their existence. It's socialization, it's learning about life. 
if I were to disconnect now, I'd probably sit in this chair for the rest of the night. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. You need to have the internet on to talk to your friends because everybody uses it. It's like a currency. If you don't use it, you're going to be at the loss. When school lets out, kids flock to their phones or laptops to log on to social networking sites, electronic hangouts, which have largely replaced real ones. The two most popular, MySpace and Facebook, have over 160 million members combined. Pretty much everyone has one. It's like a section of your inter of the internet that is your only. Like, you can make it your personality exactly. Like everyone has a MySpace. You can find the geeks, the nerds, the popular people, just all sorts of people. At the heart of the social networking site is the profile page, the hub of teens online social lives. Here, they describe themselves, post photos, receive comments from people, list their favorite bands, and most of all, accumulate friends. I get on it, I won't get off till my mom tells me to get off. <laughs> That's a thing on my face. Like, you just message your friends and leave comments, and picture comments, take pictures, like pretty pictures you put it on my face, and people comment it. <laughs> my face is a thing it is. <laughs> It'll tell you who's in a relationship, who's not in a relationship, um, when someone breaks up, or when someone gets together. On MySpace and Facebook, kids vie for who can collect the most online friends. There was a competition who could have friends most Yeah, friends. that was the big that thing was at the first. first year. Year. Yeah, yeah. But no, I have 2,000. Yeah. And then most of them you don't even know. You, you have 2,000. Because you have to admit, you really only know about 200 people. Like, you actually met them in person, you know stuff about them. You're only best friends with like 50 people. And to, having 2,000 friends, you're like, oh, she's a yeah. big or he's a big. Oh my god! <laughs> 50 best friends. That's good. Um, but really, that's the reality. I mean, for those of you who, you know, you're all sitting here because you have children, but you have teenagers. Um, and we know that we're friends one day and 30 seconds later we're not friends. And that's some of the trouble with these sites. Um, they're putting things out there and they're giving out passwords. We'll talk all about that. And, and doing things and communicating. And that is an extension of their social life. I mean, it just is their life. Their cell phones or their iPads, it just becomes, it's just fixated. Um, I don't know if you saw the, on TV, it was back on a couple months ago, they had shown, uh, she was about a year and a half old, and she was sitting there with an, I, an iPad, and she was going through it, and she was just turning the pages, look, like reading it like just doing a picture book. Then they handed her a magazine and a picture book. She had no idea what to do with it. She just kept tapping it. <laughs> this was a year and a half year old child. Because, you know, our children are just becoming, um, you know, digital natives. This is their world. They're just being born to that where, it, you know, for us, we're definitely the immigrants who are just trying to keep up with all of it. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the stats and just to kind of update you from what we heard um, in the video. Hey, we're not going to, we don't want to bore you with all, you know, all kinds of slides on the stats, but this is kind of staggering. And you can see what, you know, what your kids could possibly get into, you know, when they're on the internet. You know, 1.97 billion internet users worldwide, and that's 2010. Um, you know, so there's there's over 2 billion now. I'm sure way way over that. And you know, how much it has increased? 107 trillion emails. You, you know, it's just some staggering staggering figures. And and the websites, that's the one. You know, and, and there are a good portion of them that are that are bad websites that you know the kids uh, shouldn't be dealing with. And, 155 million. That's that's a that's a lot of uh, a lot of websites. And as the guy said on the video, there are 600 million views on Facebook. And uh, unfortunately, like I said, uh, you know, I'm getting involved in a lot of things with Facebook and in the high school and things like that. It can be a great thing, as I said before. I mean, my daughter is on it. I'm on it. My daughter's on it. She puts you know pictures of uh, the kids on there, and I, I love to see that. But for a lot of kids, it can be uh, it can be a real problem. It's just a great. It's a not a great site, but it's it's a it's a bad place to, to put some things on there, and and it, and it goes back and forth, and the kids start taunting each other and and uh, saying bad things about each other on Facebook. But uh, if it's used properly, Facebook can be a good thing. Um, that's what I you know that's what we want to say here. You know, when, when your kids are on the internet, you know the the, the four biggest thing here is that you got to be mindful of. There's, there's a lot of hateful sites on there. And there's a lot of hateful things that go on on the internet. There's violent, uh, you know, violent
violent websites, and obviously there's there's biker gangs that are on you know on the websites and, and, and the pornography sites and things like that, all kinds of illegal activities, and obviously the predators. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. We have a couple uh, you know a couple other things on, on pred online predators and things like that. We have a we have a uh, the district attorney's office has a a whole unit that deals with just online predators, just like almost all the other. Uh, you know, district attorney's offices in the United States, they deal with just online predators and things like that. Ray Cooter, a friend of mine, that has actually come to the district and done a couple of presentations. Unfortunately, he retired and moved to Florida. Lucky him. But they have some people that have replaced him, and that's what they do 24-7 is deal with uh, online predators, and it's, they're right in your backyard here, unfortunately. And if I could just chime in real quick, I think on the last slide, some of the dangers that we're mentioning up there, and we just want to bring to your attention, is because it's really out of innocence for some of the kids that are on and don't even realize that some of the things that they're doing on there can lead into X, Y, and Z. For example, if they're Googling, let's say, the White House, if they just typed in the White House, there is a White House, that would be .gov, that would be our White House uh, where the uh, president lives, but there's also the White House, other sites that are pornography sites, and they're done strategically on purpose. Some of those porn pornography sites or, or sites that um, children have no business visiting um, have very similar sounding or same taglines as other addresses that they may be looking at for either, you know, during a research project or because they want information. So they do that very strategically to rope in uh, children to kind of get hooked onto those sites. So that's just something for you to be cognizant of. But, um, I think some of the things that the kids do really start out very innocently. It's a stumble upon, it's, you know, and then unfortunately with them being so young, just really having a difficult time navigating in their own minds, what should I do now? What do I do? I came across these sites and, and that's, you know, where we really can come in. I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but one of the things that we suggest, and I'm sure it'll come up later, is that, you know, you really should have your computer in a, in a common room and it's not the greatest idea to let your kids, depending on what age they are, to have that computer in the in the bedroom or whatever by themselves because there's just like I said there's all kinds of things that they can get involved in but even if it's in a common room you you've heard of this before and I don't know a lot of these either but these are just some of the most common ones that that kids can use that they could be typing there and you could be looking right at it and they could go you know uh, p911 that means the parents are you know right behind me don't say anything uh, you know, that you wouldn't want my parents uh, to see your PAL, parents are listening, parents are watching, parents in the room, you can see it there. So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of things out there that, that they can be doing and they can be typing stuff and you won't, you won't even know it. This is one site of many, many, many sites that you can uh, go into to find out what your kids are saying. So you can actually, if you see your kid type something on, on the computer uh, that, or that looks like or a text messaging, um, that you can put that in there, and it'll give you an idea of uh, you know what like what, what they're uh, what they're doing. And so that this is like a cheat sheet website. There's there's lots of them, so um, you might want to take take that down. Oh, <coughs> no, that's, that's good. Oh. Down they want it. And I, I think this PowerPoint presentation, I think we're going to share out with all the buildings too. So they'll probably have a link either on our website or the district website or something too. So. Just one thing to let you know, and, and again, I'm not the most computer literate person in the world. I've learned a lot in the last couple years, especially doing these things. But um, not that you want to be snooping around, but well, actually, you should, especially if you're uh, elementary kids and younger kids. You really, uh, you know, you really should know what your kids are doing on the internet and what they're doing. It's it's normally it's it's your computer. You know, you're paying for the internet, and, and it's yours. So. Uh, again, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you really should have the, your pass, your kid's password to any site that they're in, and we'll talk about that later. But you can go in, you can, most of the kids know about this already, even probably your elementary kids, unfortunately, but you can go into a history and you can actually see where they've been. So you can see if, you know, God help it, if they would be at some kind of a, a, a bad site or a, you know, a biker gang site, you can, you can go into the, uh, the history up there on the left hand side of your screen where your favorites are and you'll see where, they, where they've been yesterday, uh, last week, or even a, even a month ago. So that's something you can, you can check on your kids by that uh, tracking site, that history. So this video we actually show the kids, it's on NetSmarts. Um, we show it at the elementary level and we even show it at the secondary level. 
This is just a quick, we always tell the kid not to put personal information out there. And a lot of our kids will say, oh, I don't put my real name or my address or my phone number. And they're very, you know, they do know to do that, which is fantastic. But this uh, video clip is very short. It's just going to show you how quickly, though, it is, even with very limited information, it is to actually track someone down. This is called tracking Teresa. And after we do, we show this video to the kids, and we have a little question and answer thing, and kind of quiz them on what they should be putting and what they shouldn't be putting on. How hard is it to target kids online? Let's conduct an experiment and see. We'll start by going online and selecting a harmless chat room. How about one created specifically for youth, like this one, about music? Take a look at the list of people currently in the chat room. We'll pick one at random. How about Teresa 01? Posing as a fellow chatter, we engage Teresa in a private conversation and ask her age. She shrewdly avoids giving us that information. Most online or internet service providers have user directories available to help their members identify others in the group with similar interests. Members can create and store profiles of themselves in the user directory for other members to view. While these directories can be useful, they can also make you vulnerable. We'll look for more information about Teresa by checking her member profile. We type her chat name and learn more. Good job, Teresa. She didn't list her age, location, gender, or post a picture of herself, but what does her name tell us? Is she male or female? If her brother's name is Billy Jr., what might her father's name be? If we click on the locate command, we can follow Teresa wherever she goes in cyberspace. We can also email or instant message her. After two minutes of searching, we have determined that Teresa is most likely a female teen. She likes basketball, music, and hanging out with friends. She has a little brother who most likely answers to Billy Jr. She has a valid email address and instant messenger account, and we have accurate addresses for both. Another place to look for information is newsgroup postings. Since we have a valid email address for Teresa, we can use it to search through these postings. Now I know how many messages Teresa has posted, went into what site she posted them, and the text of each message. In this posting, she has posted several personal identifiers. Can you find them? They are her telephone number, the time of day when she will most likely be home, her mother or sister's name, and her email address. Within eight minutes, we know that her first name is Teresa. She appears to be in her teens. Her interests are basketball, music, and hanging out with friends. She has a younger brother named Billy Jr. She has valid email and instant messenger accounts. She has a mom or sister named Sue. We have a good idea of what time of day we can find her at home and know her home telephone number. How useful is her telephone number? Even if we only had her area code, we could use it to quickly get an idea of her geographic location. However, since we have her entire telephone number, let's use it to perform a reverse lookup and see what else we can find out about Teresa. The search yielded the last name of the person Teresa's telephone number is registered to. Most likely Teresa's last name as well. For those of you wondering about your own telephone numbers right now, there's good news. Most services will allow you to change or eliminate your personal data from their directories if you find it there. But you have to find the services that list your information before you can request that it be removed. As for Teresa, we now have her last name. Let's see what information we can get searching with it. We'll need another directory. How about the white pages? With every additional piece of information, we can perform more searches. We'll enter her last name and start our next search. I bet we can find out where she lives now that we have her name. There she is. Hmm, Laurel. I'm not familiar with that town. Let's see if we can find more information. I'll look it up on a map search. One click and I'm there. But I think I'd like a closer look. And what if I want to find out how to get there? No problem. I can easily get directions online that will tell me step by step how to get from where I am to where Teresa lives. Now, what about schools? Where does Teresa go to school? That should be pretty easy to narrow down. So let's go to an online search engine and put in the details we have found that will be most useful to us. Laurel School. Our search leads to local schools. We can read articles about events in which these schools have been involved. We have the street address for the schools, but most importantly, we can link to the school's websites. That will allow us to find even more detailed information about the school, such as class times, lunch schedules, and possibly pictures of students. It's been 20 minutes since we first identified Teresa in the chat room. Let's review what we've discovered about her in that short time. We know that she is a female teen. We know her full name is Teresa Doe. Her email address is teresa01 at email dot dot. She likes basketball, music, and hanging out with friends. She has a brother named Billy. She collects or trades music. We know the full names of her mother, father, and brother. We know her home telephone number is 555-888-1212.
We know she's probably home by 5.30 p.m. on weekdays. Her mom gets home from work by 5.30. She lives at 111 Liberty Road in Laurel, to which we were able to get specific directions. And finally, we know what schools are closest to her home. Hopefully, this will make you take a closer look at what you or your children are posting online. Like I said, we usually do a little quiz with the kids, and after we show that video, and they're really good, they, they come up, we ask them, you know, what are the things that you should not be putting on the internet, and they pretty much, they pretty much cover everything, so they're, they're usually, uh, and, and uh, I wanted to tell you guys, too, we're starting this out in fourth grade now, because we were doing fifth and sixth grade before, now we're actually, uh, we've done a couple fourth grade classes, and uh, the fourth graders come up with some, some, you know, some good questions, and they, 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 uh, they know their stuff too. So, but it's, it's good to, good to start them a little younger because this is the world of technology. So, uh, I'm glad we're starting in some of the fourth grade classes. I think this is one of the most important things. This is the same thing we show the kids, and I think this is some of the most important things. And you've heard these before, but you know, with kids, it's tough. And the biggest thing is to keep your password private. Kids are kind of like they want to share and uh, they want to give their passwords out, it's their best friend. But what we tell the kids is that it might be your best friend today, but next week you guys might have a fight or something, and you're not best friends. And if, if that other person has their password, they're done. And as they say, they're toast, because they can get into any of their sites, and then they can put something out over the internet or on a text or something, and if, it, if it's a threat or something like that, who are the police going to come to? They're going to come to, you know, to the person that, that owns that, uh, that machine. So we really stress, you know, do not give out your passwords, but do give your pass passwords to your parents. Like I said, you guys should have all the passwords you know, to, to the computer, to any social websites or anything like that. You guys should have, uh, I probably, uh, Nicole will talk about this later, um, uh, Mr. Halligan that's actually coming back here uh, in a couple months ago, yeah. Um, you know, he had the password uh, for his son, and if he wouldn't have had that password, he, he probably wouldn't have found out a lot of information about what happened to his son. So you really should you pay for the internet, as I said, you pay probably you pay for that computer. You really should know, you know, the password to, to any of the uh, sites your kids are in. And of course, we tell the kids to be careful what sites we, uh, you know, that you go into. It really is, even in this area. There are predators that are out there. They're in, you know, internet sites. They're in a big one is gaming sites. Your kids play. I know my nephew's a big one. He's in into uh, um, you know, these gaming websites, and he actually was a victim of. Uh, I didn't know it that in some of these gaming sites you have to actually have to put money into an account to play some of these things. And he gave one of his friends his password, and the friend got in there. And, took some of his money out or transferred or whatever. So, I mean, we found out, you know, who it was, but that's one of the big things about your passwords because that this kid had, you know, had access to his uh, his money account and all those kind of things. And then we tell the kids, obviously, never, ever post any personal information on, on your uh, social websites. You all know what, what that can get into. All right, we're going to move a little bit into cyberbullying. So what is cyberbullying? Cyberbullying is exactly the same thing as traditional bullying. There's an imbalance of power. It's usually aggressive in some nature. Um, it's hurtful and mean. However, the difference is it's done through technology, whether it's through the internet, whether it's through instant messaging, Facebook, cell phone, um, on, an I, on an iPad or an iTouch, whatever. So it's the same thing. It's repetitive in some nature. It's hurtful and mean spirited in some way. Uh, we definitely have seen over the years an increase in cyberbullying. We'll talk a little bit about why we've seen such an increase. So let me show you a quick video that we show the kids. It's this, probably Ray's this, favorite. This is my favorite. <laughs> this, this is you can hear a pin drop when the kids see his video. Was... Okay, Lindsay, you're up. Today we're going to talk about Patty. Patty's best characteristics, she's stupid. Stupid and ugly. Everything she does is ugly. Watch her eat. Watch her stuff her face. Look at her. Greasy hair, dirty fingernails. It makes me want to vomit. Her dad doesn't work. They have no money. That's why she wears that nasty pink sweater. Everyone hates her, even the teachers, and they're supposed to like everyone. Get a life, Patty. Thank you. That is what 
So a little bit about uh, some of the characteristics that are similar and or different. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, what's similar about it is there are inbounds power, turf it's aggressive, and mean in some way. But here's some difference of why I think cyberbullying has really taken off. Number one is the anonymity. Because you can sit behind a screen, whether it's behind your cell phone, your computer screen, you name it. I mean, even think for ourselves as adults. Um, you know, if we, someone sends us an email or sends us a text message or something that, you know, gets us upset or, you know, you can read it in any tone that you want. And so, you know, sometimes we, even as adults, are more apt to say, write something back. Or, you know, if we send text messages to each other, we do that so we don't actually have to communicate um, in some verbal way. So if we have to cancel, sometimes we'll send a quick email or a text message, it kind of gets us off the hook. So it's the anonymity of that that really kids feel very free. It, it's that filter where, you know what, I can just say whatever I want because they can't see the other person's face. When the kids watch this video and they see what it looks like when that girl is being made fun of, they can relate to that. They say, oh my gosh, that's so mean. I'd be so sad. I wouldn't want to come to school. But they're not thinking of that when they're on the other side because they don't see that reaction or that body language. The accessibility, it's at everyone's fingertips. It's everywhere. Um, we have always said, as Ray mentioned earlier, please keep your computer in your living room. Well, now I can't really even find people who have like a hard top computer. So that does, everyone has a laptop um, or an iPad or something of that nature. So, you know, but it's the same kind of rules have to apply, you know, really, you know, having the kids keep it in a common area and not picking up that device and taking it somewhere where that you're not um, in the vicinity to be on top of what's going on there. Some of the punitive fears, I won't get in trouble. No one will know it's me, how they're gonna find me, I have a fake username, or as uh, Mr. Wilson mentioned earlier, sometimes with our young ladies, um, when they have each other's passwords, when they have a falling out of some sort, they log on to each other's sites, or their Facebook page, or their IMing, and then they're saying mean things to each other, but here's the difference, what they're doing now is, then they are logging off and changing that password, so now I go to log on to my site, I can't even take it down. I can't log on because Susie hates me and she logged on as me and she changed my password. I don't know what it is. Now I can't get it off. So now it's up there for everyone to see. Everyone thinks I said all these mean things and I can't take it away. So there's this fear of, you know, this lack of fear that they're going to get caught or be found out. Uh, the bystanders, you know, this is a huge thing that we really teach, especially with our anti-bullying program and with Olveus, is that we really need to engage the bystanders. You know, there are children who unfortunately are victims and children unfortunately who act as bullies. However, our largest population are the kids who, who see it happening and who are either fearful that it will happen to them or don't really know what to do. So it's really our job to help empower those students. When you have internet or someone's posting on Facebook, that went away from like maybe three or four kids sold to like hundreds of thousands um, of things that could be putting on there. So um, if you've ever gone on or Googled yourself, um, I encourage all of you to try doing that. That's always a good time. Go home and Google yourself and, and see all the things that are out there by yourself that maybe you didn't even realize, pictures that may be on there, different things. So, But it just really opens it up to such a large group of people who really can see and then weigh in. Everybody feels that they have a right to kind of weigh in on things. Um, so that's where that comes in. And as I mentioned, the disinhibition. Really, you know, it's, they're not worried that, you know, something bad could happen. It sort of takes that human piece out. Technology has sort of removed the human piece that we have interacting with each other. It's sort of pulled that away a little bit. And so um, it's a little different for them. And I think some of the social skills, and as I have moved now from the elementary school to the high school, I even see it with some of the kids with eye contact, shaking someone's hand. Um, I, I get sad when some of the kids, you know, don't even know how to write a thank you note or address an envelope or sign their signature. And um, because some of the things they've just gotten away from, some of those social things that came safe second nature to us as we were growing up. So let's talk a little bit about some of the forms. Harassment, um, just like your everyday traditional harassment, same kind of thing, but just sending repeated offensive messages in some capacity. Denigration. Um, some of these things that we share with the kids, they need to know that some of the things that they're doing, not only are there are repercussions, say, from their parents and they get in trouble or from a school perspective, but to the whole next level of the law. Um, because the kids don't realize, does anyone in the room know the average age, like how old do you have to be to get arrested? How old a kid has to be to be arrested? What would your guess be? 16, what do you think? 13? 10, Mr. Gabon, no. It's 10 years old. 
So the kids don't realize that their behavior, or it's called defamation of character. I mean, just harassing someone or threatening someone or, or saying hurtful, mean things. When they put it in writing and they're doing it that way, I mean, that's against law. You cannot harass people like that um, and do those things. Just like you can't do it in everyday life, you simply can't do it online. Uh, some of the posting or altering digitally pictures. I had done some work with our junior class uh, during some time when uh, there was during PSSA time. And so uh, we had done an activity with them by showing them um, an ABC school special, which was called Cyberbully. It had ran, ran last spring and all summer, actually. It was an ABC family movie. You can see it. It still runs on that channel if you have that channel online. It's about a teenage girl who was just, just tormented. Uh, for a long time. So we had shown that to the to the junior class and then we had done a live feed with them for them to give feedback about like, you know, what are some things they're doing online. It was really interesting to see how many kids, and now they could do it anonymously, so I guess they felt, so that was great because they could do it live feed. I actually shared back with the class on the TV their actual answers. And it was so interesting how many kids admitted to digitally altering either their pictures online or what they're doing for reasons of, I want to look thinner, I don't want to have acne, I don't want to have braces. I want people to think I'm going out on Friday night when I'm really not. So I say that I went to that party, or I say I went there, or here, or, and so they're doing this because that is their social, their, their social way of life, and they want people to see them differently or to be different, and online you can be different. But the thing is that the kids think we heard, you know, in the very beginning, you know, oh, it's fun to get 2,000 friends. You only really know 300, and you have 50 best friends. But in their reality, these are all their friends. And so they feel that they know everybody online. But see, I could go online and pretend to be anybody and put a picture that I'm 13 up on there when we work with um, your students <coughs> in elementary level. And uh, we're working now with 4th, 5th, and 6th grade. It's amazing how many kids in 4th, 5th, and 6th grade have Facebook. And so, how old do you have to be to be on Facebook? Do you know? 13. And there's very few 13-year-olds, a couple in sixth grade, but <coughs> in the district there's very few. And so, um, the kids in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade are on Facebook, and how do they get logged on to Facebook, do we know? Who does that for them? Parents. So, and so I say, well, how old are you on Facebook? I'm 16, I'm 20, not, it's not to worry. Like, don't worry, I'm 16 on Facebook, or I'm 20 years old on Facebook. And so I say, then who are you attracting on Facebook? You're attracting 16-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds. If they think you're 20, then that's who you're attracting. That's who's friending you. And, you know, some of the kids will openly admit, well, I see stuff on there I probably shouldn't see. I see pictures that my mom or dad would be pretty upset if I saw. But when they now friend a 20-year-old, they're going to see pictures of kids drinking or smoking pot or doing drugs or not wearing, you know, clothing. So it's just something to think about um, when that's happening. Flaming your online fighting. Um, boys really, uh, boys and girls do this differently. Girls do this and it goes on for like months and months, oh gosh, forever. I, you know, we hold grudges forever, really. Boys, where this comes into play is they say some really, really mean things to each other online. Then they meet up outside, then they get in a fist fight, and then it's over. So it's sort of the same thing that they did before, but now, it, it, but the problem is with this, the online, especially for the boys, is um, they put like locations for people to go see it. Go videotape it. If you, you know, look at YouTube ever, or even on the news, don't you feel like every day, I can't tell the news hardly anymore, but you know, like, like these flash mobs of kids in Philly, they're just beating up people, and um, the man that was almost just killed the other day's face by a couple teenage kids. So this, you know, starting fights, meeting up in certain spots to purposely do that. The only, if you will, saving grace for some of this that the kids are doing, the difference is, they're just not as smart. They don't have the common sense that some adults do, thankfully. So that when they're putting this stuff on there, they don't realize that the police see that. So when the police show up to bust the party or bust the fight, they're like, how does the police know? <laughs> well, they know because it's on here. So they don't have that, sometimes that common sense of um, who actually will see that. They don't really think that through. I want to interject one thing. I, I noticed at the high school that Nicole was saying about the girls. It, it is unbelievable. It just seems to keep going on and on and on. And, and you know, the, the guys, like you said, unfortunately, sometimes they settle and it's over. But I, I've really got an education at the high school, seeing some of the things that are that are put on the internet and 
texting and things between some, some of the girls. It's, it's unbelievable. They call that the, the mean girls thing. And the, actually, Dr. LeBlanc from the Bo Tech School does a, a whole presentation on mean girls and about uh, you know, flaming and texting and harassing and things like that. And it's pretty prevalent. So it, unfortunately, it's, it, it's made bigger by, by the internet and uh, texting and, and, and the phones and things like that. And really, this is not a North Trent problem. No. This, is, this is something that happens across the country, across the world. Um, this summer, when I was over in Europe, there, the headline in the UK magazine was how uh, Facebook is just, just running rampant of just torturing children and their teachers. That now they're, you know, that the parents and the teachers are just in these wars on Facebook, and that this hurtful messages. Are, I mean, it's just, and that was over in the, in the UK. So. It's just amazing how this has just become such a global phenomenon. Impersonation, pretending that you're someone else, uh, fraudulent activity, doing something in some way, outing or trickery, sharing your secrets. There's a lot of um, online journaling. And uh, I think some of the online journaling is to encourage kids to feel free to write. It's like having a diary online, just like we would have had a diary. Instead of writing it down, now you do it online. So for some of these kids, it's an outlet. And online journaling can be a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, what we're seeing happen is there are these outing and trickery or um, kids are journaling and think that it's all confidential and, you know, it's like a, remember, remember when we were in school and like you'd write on a piece of paper like, do you like Joey? Circle yes or no. Do you like, you know, so that's what we would do. But now, they do it online, but then what happens is then someone releases it all. So like the next day you show up at school and everyone's mad at you because, you called me fat or you called me ugly because they're just outing all these kids' journals. Um, so they're tricking kids to kind of give yeah, up that, that information. That thing where you put the vote up there and it comes down and vote yes or no. It's just the technology is just helping them do these things. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, cyber stalking, um, just stalking someone online, threatening their safety in some way, um, kind of knowing their every move, you know, by tracking them online. And um, they can do that with cell phones. I mean, we have people who do stalking because our phones have GPS systems in there. Kids don't realize that when they take pictures, um, so they're out and they take a picture. And then they put, post that picture on Facebook. Well, if they're using a smartphone or an iPhone that has a GPS tracking system, once they upload that picture to the internet, anyone can click on that picture and find the location of where they are. So um, kids don't realize that that's happening. Um, and so we have, you know, that's where the stalking comes in. Um, going on, being able to find locations of where, where kids are located. Yep. A little bit about cyberbullying in schools. Okay, well, this is this is where I come in, and uh, I've been involved in you know several investigations. Uh, there's a couple couple different things that uh, this is this is a tough one. Whether you know whether the kids do do this at school or at home, this is the two things that we get involved in. And there's a there's a couple court cases. Actually, just going back, back uh, apparently just I think yesterday, the Supreme Court uh, for the police now, um, when Nicole was talking about the, the GPS, now the police have to have a warrant, uh, a warrant to do a GPS track. Like if you're trying to tra track somebody, I'm all for you know everybody's uh, constitutional rights, but that's just something now that's kind of thwarted the police again. Uh, you know when they're trying to track some people down with GPS. And that just came out, I think, just a day or two ago. The Supreme Court said we need a warrant for that, but um, you know, hopefully that won't uh, that won't uh, be too difficult to, to get a to get a warrant because that's how we you know find some of these uh, cyber uh, bullies and, and predators and things like that through GPS tracking, some of those things. But um, going back to uh, the school thing, um, obviously, if the kids are doing something in school, if they're texting threats or doing some threats in school, it's, you know, you can, you know, the school can uh, have their consequences and also, you know, they can be, uh, you know, they can have police problems too. The, the problem comes in if the kids do something at home. Um, there's, like I said, there's a couple different court cases, but they are starting to come around a, a little bit. But if a kid threatens somebody at home and those two words there in the middle of that thing substantially disrupts, that means if they substantially disrupt the orderly operation of the school, then you know, then the school can intervene and they can do discipline, you know, uh, give us a, a suspension or something. So if a kid is at home and he threatens somebody at home, and that that girl or, or guy comes into school and is crying, 
tells another student, it disrupts the whole class, the teacher can't teach, and we've had a couple of them where something started to go on Facebook and things like that, and a girl came in and was crying, and she told a friend, and she was crying, and, and everybody was all, and they, sometimes they can't even, uh, the teachers can't even, you know, teach their class, so the laws are saying that if you substantially disrupt the order operation, orderly operation in the school, that you can be, uh, you know, that, that you can be, you know, given police consequences and school consequences. And we try to tell the kids, too, that, you know, school setting means, means you know, school buses, school bus stops. We have had some incidents where a kid's standing right at his bus stop and he's doing something, you know, on the cell phone, threatening somebody on the cell phone. That can actually be considered school grounds. At a school-sponsored activities, we have a lot of things and dances and things like that. So, um, just because they're outside of the perimeter of the school doesn't mean that they can, you know, uh, uh, get school sanctions as long as they're in one of these designated areas. And uh, like, like Nicole was saying before too, I don't want you to think that we have a, a serious problem here. In my duties as state school coordinator, I go to a lot of meetings around the county, and I've been in some state meetings in Harrisburg and things like that. It's it's similar at all the you know at all the. Uh, uh, the district, so it's, I don't think it's a real serious problem here, but, but uh, it's something, like I said, it is a big part of my job right now, um, dealing with some of the harassments and, and threats that, that uh, come through, just because that's the way of life right now. He, kids don't talk to each other anymore. I've, I've had kids in the high school, a girl standing across the hall, and they're texting each other, and, and, I, and, and I, you know, sometimes, before we used to have it, that you couldn't text in the hallways. I didn't want to tell you that. We have kind of a pilot program this year at the high school where the kids are allowed to use their cell phones in the hallways and in the cafeteria and things like that. They're allowed to listen to their iPods. And some of you might not agree with that, but I'm, I don't know what Nicole's thoughts are, but I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's actually calming the kids down. Look, we are getting a little bit of uh, the kids sometimes doing some, some texting threats and things like that, but uh, I actually think it's a pretty good idea. I think it calms the kids down when they're, in the, they're, they're busy doing their things in, in the hallway on their way to uh, their class. Some of them are listening to music, and I think our fights in the hallways and things that have, have actually lessened, you know, have, have uh, substantially decreased. And then obviously once they're in the classroom, then they have to uh, put them away because we don't want the, the cheating and, and things like that that can go on with texting. So uh, I think it's been, been working out pretty well. And I even think I heard that maybe some of the middle schools um, might try it uh, next year on, on a pilot program also. All right, so a couple of intervention tips to just, you know, to take away with before we move on to the next topic. Um, you know, save the, uh, we always tell the kids, do not respond. We're not looking for it to turn it or go back and forth. Save the email for evidence. Print it out. You have every right to contact your provider or the local police authorities or the school. Um, and definitely so that we can help intervene or help support that. Um, definitely. Um, if there's other educational things, I think, you know, here at North Penn School District over the last couple of years, introducing the Obeyes program has been a wonderful thing because we've actually been tracking it since 2008 and I've actually shared results out for now seven of the buildings to really see how the kids are really getting to know each other and forming communication skills and really their social skills and uh, there's been a reduction in bullying and there's an increase in reporting and it's just, it's really been great and it's really allowed the time to come in and to do topics like this for the kids. I think at this point, we've basically been, in the last two years, to every elementary school um, addressing internet safety, all three of the middle schools. We do things at the high school all the time. So, um, and we've actually, well, I know that I've been to every home and school meeting that um, has been up and running with all day, so everyone's on board with that, and um, we do community forums. So it's been so great that North Penn has really stood behind the forms and getting the information out to all of you and to the kids because we really think it's really important to be proactive and not just reactive um, so that the kids have the skills to do that just like we want you to have them. On, one thing, on, on the other uh, hand too with the police departments, I think we have, if you want to say, have our act together here in the school district, but the police departments do too. I've been out of police work now for since 06. And back when I was a cop, I mean, when somebody called and said they were getting texting threats and internet threats, we, we really didn't know what to do. It really wasn't. Now, um, some of the police, most of the police departments have a specific detective or somebody on the police department that deals with these online things. So if you have a problem and it's happening at, at home or 
you're son or daughter or somebody is getting threatened or something over the internet, don't hesitate to call the police. I'm probably getting ahead of myself again at the end. Well, you know, don't hesitate to call because that we, you know, that's they're dealing with that a lot now in the police department. This next video is a very short clip. This is going to introduce um, sexting. <laughs> Some of the younger fourth graders would say, hey, well, what's, what's that guy doing? And then we tell them a little bit about you know, what, it, what an internet predator is. I think that's another uh, pretty good, pretty good video. Uh, and that's that's a fast, you know, a minute video. Basically, that's how fast it can happen with the way how fast the internet is and what different kids have their uh, their address books and things like that, and they send it to you know one person, and that person that is 50, 100, 1,000 kids on his address list and sends it to, to somebody else. Um, sexting, we do have, we, I have been involved in some, some, uh, some sexting uh, things in, in the district and involved with the police department. And obviously if you don't know what that is, it's, it is sending explicit nude images or movies and you know, explicit uh, uh, pornography is basically, you know, basically what it is. So we, we have had a, a couple of, uh, you know, a couple instances of that uh, in the district, and like I said, the, all the police departments have uh, been very cooperative, have a good working relationship with that. We've made made some arrests on, on some of them. Just you know, to keep it in mind, we tell we do we do uh, we tell the, the middle school and the uh, high school kids a little bit more. We don't really go into this too much, obviously, with, with elementary kids, but um, you know, we do tell them that, um, like we said, the age is 10 years old. So if you transmit uh, sexually explicit pictures, which is pornography, um, you can be arrested for that. It's, you know, if you get it and you transmit that, and nowadays it's easy to do that. It's easy to track them down with these IP addresses and all that, these kind of things. But if you if you get a picture, and then once you transmit that to somebody else, you're just as guilty as the person that uh, that made that video. Um, I was involved in a situation at one of the middle schools where we did a presentation. And I don't know how long it was, it might have been six months later, where I got called into the principal's office and there was a girl sitting there, and unfortunately she had sent a, an explicit picture of herself, and it, it, it got out, and as soon as I walked in the door, her face dropped, and she said, oh, you're, you're Mr. Wilson, aren't you? You did that presentation to us. And I said, yeah. I said, you didn't listen to me, did you? And she said, no. And 
just didn't think I sent it to my boyfriend, and I didn't think he would send it anywhere, but obviously he sent it out to some friends, and it, it got all over the place. So I don't think she will ever do that again. I think she learned her lesson, but unfortunately it's, it was too late. And the video, of the, uh, the girl you see here, you've probably heard of her. This was a classic example where she you know, sent a picture to her boyfriend, and then you know, it, wasn't, you know, it wasn't her boyfriend uh, after a little while, and that her picture got sent out all over, and just to make a long story, story short, um, she committed suicide over, you know, over the sex thing. So that's 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 the worst, you know, the worst part of it. Um, the tips, of course, are you know, think about it. We tell the kids to we stress this over and over. Think about you know what you're sending, you know, and before you press that send button or the send key or the transmit or the enter. Just think about what the consequences might be. We, we stress that to these kids. We do our presentations over and over again. We have a little bit of a funny story about never take images of yourself. Actually, Pat Hannerham, the, the officer that does this, uh, he has a, uh, uh, a son that he found a picture of. I think it was the, the son was he's a he's a real he's a real sports guy. And he was in he was in I think he was in his jockey shorts or something. He had a picture on his phone. Pat was going through his phone and, and, he, and he saw the picture and he said. Do you think your uh, your mom, your grandma, mom want to see this picture? And he's no, not really. He's well, maybe you should take that off. So we always have a, a little thing where you know, to the kids we tell them if, if this is some picture that you wouldn't want to show your mother, father, or your grandmother, don't don't be having it you know on your phone. Um, social um, network. Yeah, this is our last um, part of the presentation. But social networking sites, we talked a little bit about them, but there are so many out there. I mean, this is just a little. Um, menagerie of them, but there's hundreds of them. But really, since 2011, some things have just taken off and how many users are currently on each of the sites. Um, and these are just users who are just visiting them on a regular, on a daily basis. So uh, this is happening, you know, over and over again. You just see how fast they're taking off. I mean, kids are on the computer a lot, and we're on computers as a lot of adults, so um, they're just going off. I mean, MySpace, look, that has dropped down in the last two years. That's like almost falling off. That's, that's you know, that's, whew, forget about that. I mean, people aren't even on that anymore. So Not that's, sure even that's old hat. You know what I mean? And Facebook. Yeah. So I'm sure something, you know, very soon will come out. I mean, there's, well, I'll talk to you about some other ones outside of Facebook now. But these are some of the top networking sites. Facebook, um, I'm thinking most of you are familiar with, but that is a social networking site uh, for, uh, for anyone over the age of 13 videos, great things, and a lot of things we share tonight. I mean, technology is a wonderful tool. It's not to say that it isn't. It just need, we just need to really be able to, you know, give our kids the skills so that they use it appropriately and give you the knowledge so that you know what to look for and how to make sure that everything's going status quo so that technology can be utilized to its highest potential. I mean, there are really great benefits with technology. We just have to stay on top of it because where there comes the benefits, unfortunately, there also comes the other side. Uh, LinkedIn is a site now that's out there for young professionals or uh, who are looking. You can link in to try to find jobs or with other professional people, different things of that nature. Twitter, that's basically where you can up late, up uh, date every moment of your life um, out to anyone. So, and I know the district does use it to keep. I know some. I know that Mr. Cabone uses it to keep um, his parents up to date with what's happening in the school or different sites, and that's a great, great use of the account. Um, Ooh, a new one. This has come around and recently. This is a free video chat that you can upload to any device. A computer, an iPad, an iTouch, you know, um, whatever, a phone, anything you want there. So um, I know that uh, some of our kids at a very young age are getting iTouches because, um, you know, they, they play music and everyone thinks, well, they're not a phone, it's just an iTouch and so I have that and, you know, my kid likes to play games on it. But you can do instant message chatting, you can text people, you can take pictures and send them. Um, so you can do all the same functions that you could do with a, that a cell phone could do, except for actually hold a conversation. Um, you can do the free video chat. So it's like instant IMing or Skyping, if you've heard of Skype, it's sort of the same kind of principle of that. Uh, Skype is a great free service that you do not pay money for, that if you have family that lives somewhere else in the country, or around the world, it's a great tool. My mom's in Florida right now for six weeks. I'd love you know, to get on and, and say hi to her and see her face and so we can chit chat and stuff. Um, so again, a great tool, but um, something that's free and that you may or may not know that your kids have installed on things because these are free, so it's not like some of the apps the kids will say, you oh, mom or dad, can I get this? It costs 99 cents. But with the free ones, you may not know if it's on your kids' 
iPad or iTouch or whatnot because they don't have to get permission to do that or, or clearance for that. Uh, Plaxo is a new one here. This is sort of like a white pages, if you will. What makes me nervous about this is there are very, very, very few security controls that I could see on Plaxo when I was going through it. Um, and so it's like a personal contact that could just be like leaked out to everybody. I mean, you really have a, you can't really even set like a control on it. Um, at least with the white pages, you can put in a request if you're not located in the white pages. In the hardback, you don't have to be located on the one on the computer. Um, but this is not. This is just free information. Um, and we know with telemark, everybody just sells everybody's information. Uh, we actually had a, a solicitor who called to the high school the other day and wanted all the names and numbers for all the students in the high school because he wanted to send free information about like some funding for um, college and different things. And uh, he had contacted Phil Travers, who's our department chair, and he said, I can't give you that information. He said, well, I, did, I figured you wouldn't, but he said, I'll just buy it. Like, I'll just go and buy North Penn's list, of, and then he'll send out all the mailings. So when you get mailings, sometimes they come to you, and like, how to, you know, but we see that a lot in the high school. And so people, at the high, sometimes parents will contact us and say, oh, what is this financial aid night you're having? We're like, well, we're not having a financial aid night. But someone, a company, has taken all the addresses and sent that out. So this plaque is the same kind of thing. You're just taking all that contact information and can't really set a control on that. I want to share this with you quick. I don't know how many of you have college age students yet, but someday you will. This is always something that kids um, always say, well, how much do colleges know? Or can I really not get into college before? Can I really not get that scholarship? Plus, you, you know, could that really affect my job? The answer is absolutely yes. And now you're going to see a really short video clip from um, area colleges where they actually did a panel discussion, it's a couple minutes long, but a panel discussion of what impact can your Facebook and the decisions that you make now have on your future when you're going to apply for college or go for that scholarship. We had a couple young ladies who were vying for one scholarship in Ohio State, three young ladies, very matched up with the GPA, their class rank, their athletic ability, uh, and the coach said I'd like to see all three of your Facebooks and only one got the scholarship. Um, you'll hear here um, that, yes, college admissions people are saying, we have so many kids in, uh, enrolling right now that are we looking at every single child's Facebook? Absolutely not. I mean, that task would be so tedious. However, they are investigating all the ones on where they get a tip to investigate. We could guess where the tips are coming from. The tips are coming from other students and other parents because they want them to get in over somebody else because it's so much pressure to get into your Ivy League we're now with this economy, you know, the state schools have taken off. Westchester alone this year, uh, they had 75,000 students this year apply to Westchester for 30,000 spots. It's the biggest that they've ever had, ever. I mean, Temple University, and State, I mean, the state schools are going nuts because of the economy and stuff. So, um, yes, they're starting to do more investigative things to take a look at, is this the student we want to represent us in our college, or is this the person we want our job? Um, so it does, can leave an impact um, some of the choices that they make. This is a short story. To what extent can an applicant's Facebook profile be viewed and considered by an admissions officer? I think students have to expect that if there's anything public, it's possible that we might see it. Do we have time to go back and look at Facebook pages on a regular basis? No. But if there is something that is compromising on your Facebook page or that you have done on the web that you maybe not are proud of, um, you should probably do everything you can to clean that up before you get into the admissions process. Um, that if there were something that were to um, bring into doubt your character, um, we would go and look at it. Um, and it would probably be brought to our attention at some point. Um, so we don't regularly look at Facebook pages, at least in our office we don't. Um, but uh, there have been times when if a student has done something online, um, we have to go back and look at it. And um, it's, it can affect a, a negative or our, our decision negatively. Yeah, there was a recent report and they said that of all the application acceptances that were rescinded, nearly 7% of those were for inappropriate postings on a website after they were already admitted. 
Can you characterize what might be an inappropriate posting that would really jeopardize a student's chances either before or after they were even admitted? Well, I, <clears throat> one example I can think of is a student posting about getting into one of our schools and talking about um, all the drugs and alcohol um, that they'll mm -hmm. join in over the next four years. And depending on, well, depending on how they portray that, that could be very serious. Mm -hmm. I think maybe one piece is we're creating communities, we're residential communities. I think anything that would make us concerned about the, the well-being of other members of the community, I think. And that could be that could come out any number of ways, but community well-being is, is critically important to us. And and people take it very seriously being a part of that community. So if they see something, that's where we hear about some of these postings. We don't go on and uh, and look for them, but we'll have people that are a part of our community, either that we're part or are currently a part, and say, I can't believe that you know this student is applying to Marquette. You better check this out. And that's what directs us to go and check it out. Ethical issues, things that that that, that would call into question um, uh, related to our own honor code uh, violation that, that potentially would, would look like an honor code violation would absolutely be cause for concern. So, would you recommend when a student is admitted that they look into the honor code of their student body and consider, from the point at which they're admitted, if they intend to go there, if they're bound by that honor code? And especially online, they shouldn't go out there and represent that they're doing things that are against the honor code while they're still in high school. My hope is they're doing that before they start the admissions process, not after they're admitted. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in our application, I direct students to look at our honor code um, as they start the application, because I'm expecting at every step of the process that they are working with the very um, highest level of integrity. And can all of your honor codes be found on your websites? Yes. Great. So again, just giving you a brief overview of that, you know, the choices that you make today could definitely have an impact on the future. I think kids need to understand that and think that through. And um, so, you know, I don't know where the future goes if you're sitting with a kindergarten or first grader. Who knows what that could look like when they end up in college? My gosh. Um, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. So this is the, uh, the bottom line. That This is exactly the same slides that we show the kids and I want to leave them with you who want to do that. Bottom line is do not send or post something that you do not want out there. Once it's out there, it's out there forever. You could delete it a million times, it's out there forever. And if you do it on you know, in your own personal computer, you're responsible for it. If you do it on your work computer, you're responsible for it. Um, I do this also with our staff here with professional development. You know, North Penn School District owns our computers. So if we put stuff on there or send stuff out, we're responsible for that and they can see that at any time. So it's the same thing for in your work thing. So if someone sends you something and then you turn around and disseminate it, you're then responsible for doing that. So it's something to think about. Do not give out your personal information, really. We tell the kids, do not give out your phone number, your address, and things. Don't make it easy. It's not to say that it's, it can't be found, but don't make it easy for people. You know, it should definitely be a challenge um, if they're looking. Uh, do not respond to something that, um, you know, that could be hurtful or mean. We tell the kids, do not do that. Don't go into an engaging thing here. Let someone know. Let someone at home know, someone at school know, um, and we'll help out with that when we can. Tell a trusted adult. I always tell the kids at the end of this presentation, everybody in this room, please think of one trusted adult in their life, whether it's someone in their home, in their neighborhood, in their family, at school. Um, and some of the kids will say, oh, I can't think of anyone. I'm like, oh, no, no, everyone can think of one, and everyone deserves that right. They need to have that special someone in their lives that they know that they can talk to to do that. Be aware of your surroundings. Know what's going on around you, you know, things that you're doing, the chat rooms that you're in, um, the websites. Look at the sites that your kids are on. If they're on the Disney website or the Barney website or those fun websites, be cognizant that that's also where predators are. They're on those sites because they're looking for children. They're not on adult websites. So um, just be cognizant of that and who they're communicating with. And the bottom line, as we always say, be a good online citizen. It's, our, it's your job every day to teach your kids to be respectful, responsible. We do the same thing for the seven hours that they're with us. And so we always try to assess the kids. The decision, they have such bright futures. And so we really want to ensure that the decisions that they make today really will help to ensure that their futures can be as bright as possible and that there isn't something that will be there sort of trailing behind them that really could have a negative impact on them. So um, that's something that we definitely want to stress to the kids so that they can have the best future ever. So.
that wraps up our presentation. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions for you. Um, we'll stick around for a few minutes too, for some of you who have to get going. Um, we won't be offended by that. We want to thank you so much for coming out tonight. And um, you can always contact us um, through the North Penn website. Both Ray and I you can find all our contact information. We're both house at the high school. Um, so feel free, whatever you need, okay? Thank you so much for your time.